Oh, as always, we have some handout notes available for you. If you would like to uh, write some notes down, then uh, feel free to get those prepared. Or if you don't have a copy yet, raise your hand and we'll have an usher get one to you right away. Uh, I will forewarn you that um, we won't be making it through that entire outline that's in your notes. I uh, did some last minute rearranging of that. And so don't get, don't get nervous if it starts to look a little slow. Like we've got a ministry out there on Main Street starting at 2. You better hurry up. Well, don't worry, we won't be uh, making it all the way through that outline. Uh, Lord willing, of course. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 again today, so feel free to find your way there. Lord God, we want to pray that you would now teach us. This is your word, and we want to be your people walking in humble obedience to what you tell us. And in this very relevant subject, God, give us uh, conviction in our heart, a uh, clear understanding of what you are asking and what you are providing, and that we can go away a more sanctified people unto you. And so lead in this time in Jesus' name, amen. One of the nice luxuries and blessings of life are the many appliances that we have access to. And if you're like me, you have a kitchen that's full of gadgets that are to be used in specific ways to enhance your cooking and your dining. You know, maybe it's uh, for your prep work, and this one little gadget does all your slicing and dicing, and it comes out perfectly. Maybe it's for the blending. Maybe it's for the cooking. I mean, how many different types of of fryers do they have now, and ovens of different heating technologies, different uh, pressure cookers and countertop grills, I mean, you name it, and they all say whatever they're going to say about this is going to save you time, or this is going to save you calories, or this is going to uh, save your taste buds, you know, all these types of things, you need this, you need that. And it's probably not limited to your kitchen only, but maybe you even have a whole bunch of different uh, types of uh, appliances in your bathroom, you know, like razors and clippers and hair dryers, hair straighteners, hair curlers, you know, every, everything. Well, one thing that is true of all of these is that they come with instructions from the manufacturer. Each device has a specific purpose, and it is to be used according to that purpose. Uh, and that's, that's how it is. Um, you see what happens in the little picture illustrations. If you use it incorrectly, maybe there's a lightning bolt that's jumping out of some place and zapping you. Or maybe, you know, the fingers are being bent in a strange direction. And you say, okay, well, I better follow these instructions. Otherwise, there's some consequences. Well, also, perhaps if you're like me, you've probably tried to repurpose some of those appliances to help you with projects they weren't designed for, especially if there's a house project or a, a, a car project or something like that, and you say, oh, I don't have the proper tool, but I have this, and it maybe could work, and so you, you try it, and inevitably, if you do, what happens? <laughs> you, uh, you destroy, at the very least, you damage, but usually... Uh, the complete destruction of the appliance and whatever it was intended. You know, from burning out blow dryers to uh, breaking or blunting blades and blenders or razor blades to ironing surfaces becoming contaminated with all sorts of strange sticky goo. We take those wonderfully designed appliances, use them in the improper way to their demise. <laughs> and how do we respond when we do that? Do we get frustrated with the manufacturer and complain with them that they've done a poor job? You know, do I write to Mr. Coffee and say, manufacturer, that egg that I tried to fry on the coffee burner, that surface, that egg came out horrible. And now every time I try to brew coffee, it smells like burnt eggs in my house. What's the deal? 
you know, do we, do we criticize the manufacturer when we misuse their product when it's not designed that way? Of course we don't. We say, well, that's our fault. We've been studying the book of 1 Thessalonians in the Bible. We've entered into chapter 4 where Paul addresses the subject of our sexual behavior. And not that I'm trying to compare that to a specific kitchen or bathroom appliance. <laughs> You're like, which, which one? Um, but something that we learned last week is that God created and designed the sexual relationship. He's the manufacturer, if you will. And with it, he has included some very clear instructions in the environment in which we are to uh, be active in our sexual behavior. And as long as we keep it according to the manufacturer's very clear instructions, we are blessed. The problem is that people take what is so sacred and so powerful, something that has a very specific purpose that is meant to bring the husband and wife together in a unified relationship in a bond unlike any other oneness that any other relationship is supposed to experience. People take that and they use it instead outside of the, the proper usage. They use it with whomever in whatever situation they want. You know, as a result, it causes great problems. We all know that you're not supposed to take that clothes iron and make a grilled cheese sandwich with it. Maybe you've tried that. And then do we go back and we complain because of now the iron is uh, fairly ruined and all of the clothes that we iron from that point forward are messed up and let alone the complaints about the poor grilled cheese sandwich, it doesn't even do that well. You know, it's important that we understand the sexual relationship from the manufacturer's point of view, understanding why he designed it, the parameters for its use. And in fact, in our text from last week, we saw Paul relate the clearest of instructions for us, that it is to be kept within the boundaries of marriage. It is to be enjoyed within the boundaries of marriage. For it says there in 1 Thessalonians 4, we are to abstain from sexual immorality. Don't take this act that is so powerful to the human and use it however you want, in whatever application you want. No, use it within marriage so that its power is a benefit to the building of a strong marriage, a strong unity, not something that is taken out of that context and used to break down and destroy a marriage. We'll read the text here in just a moment, but I want to remind us of the greater context behind what's going on at this point in the letter of 1 Thessalonians. Remember, in chapters 1 through 3, as we've studied, Paul was giving thanks and commending that church in Thessalonica for living the way they were supposed to live as Christians, and they were pleasing God. They were doing well. They were standing firm in their faith. But in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul encourages them to excel still more. Rather than saying living adequately is enough, he says, take it to the next level. And to help them take it to the next level in their Christian walk, Paul addresses several subjects regarding their everyday behavior. He reminds them of things he's already taught them previously. He also elaborates on certain subjects. He clarifies certain points for them. And the very first subject he addressed, and it will be topic after topic throughout the rest of this book, but the first one that he addresses is our sexual activity, our sexual behavior. <laughs> of all the things that he could have brought up first, of every issue in life, he brings up our sexual behavior first. You know what that indicates? That indicates that our sexual behavior is an important subject to God. He does care 
how we behave in this regard. We know historically that Thessalonica was a very sexually immoral city, and the Christians there, those that had come to know Jesus Christ, a lot of them had come out of a very sexually immoral lifestyle, and they would have been tempted to go back into that. It was even part of their former religious service and worship. And so it would have been very tempting to them, and so Paul wants to remind them and encourage them further in their purity and you and I know experientially today in our country and world that it's not a whole lot different than ancient Thessalonica. We have the sexually explicit, immoral presentations of things all around us all the time. We're tempted day in and day out. So this was not only important for the church in Thessalonica. This is an important subject matter for you and me today. Well, let's go ahead and read what Paul wrote to the Christians here in Thessalonica. Pay close attention to the instructions he's giving here so as to be able to excel in our sexual morality, our sexual purity. Starting in verse 3 through verse 8, Paul says, For this is the will of God. Right there we know this is going to be good, right? We always want to know God's will. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So in this passage, there are at least five instructions for us to understand and apply if we want to excel in our sexual morality. Now, we examined the first one last week. We learned in verse 3 that we need to be set apart. Not set apart from sexual activity, but in our sexual behavior, it needs to be set apart from what is sexually immoral. The sinful spin on the whole matter that the world proposes. Instead, we need to be set apart unto what God has designed what God has given us. Paul used the word sanctification, which means set apart, three times in this section, verse 3, 4, and 7. It's important for us in order to understand what sexual immorality is to first of all understand, well, what is sexual morality? It's a horrible misconception out there that people have to believe that God is opposed to sexual behavior that God is against such a thing, that he believes that it's just like a necessary evil so the human race can continue on. That is a misconception. We took the, under the, the time last week to try to understand what sexual morality is, and we learned that God actually created it by giving the capacity to humanity by creating us male and female. It's by God's design. Not only did he create it, we learned that he commanded it. When he told the husband and wife to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, you don't have to read too far between the lines to understand what he's saying. So keeping in mind that not only did he create man and woman and marriage, the sexual relationship, not only did he create it and command it, he did all of that before the fall of humanity into sin. That was part of a sinless existence. It has to be something that can be viewed as holy and right and good. But not only did he create it and command it, he gave instructions where he confined it to the marriage relationship. It's not to be something done before marriage. It's not something to be done with someone outside of the marriage. It is not to be done in in, the, uh, in an illegitimate, non-biblical marriage arrangement. 
And so understanding those truths, there are no other rules to go along with it. Whereas God is the creator of the original, the good, the healthy, the holy activity, Satan and, and humanity in rebellion against God, and they have devised all sorts of perversions and counterfeits. Uh, sexual activity that would appear to be good and satisfying, but that actually brings trouble in various forms, and we'll talk more about it next week, but it even gets the attention of the avenger we see, which should be very alarming to us. So understanding sexual morality helps us more clearly understand what Paul means when he says that God's will for us is to abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is anything that is outside of sexual morality. It's very easy to define. Sexual morality is the activity between a husband and a wife alone inside of a biblical marriage. By the way, a biblical marriage is one biological male and one biological female joined together in marriage. Anything outside of that is a form of immoral perversion of God's provision. If it's before marriage, the technical biblical term is called fornication, and that is a perversion, a sexual perversion of God's provision. If it's with someone other than your spouse, if you're a married person, if it's outside of your marriage, it is a perversion. It's called in Scripture, it's called adultery. That is a form of sexual perversion outside of God's provision. Uh, if it's sexual uh, relationship with, uh, within an illegitimate, non-biblical marriage uh, between two people of, of the same biological sex. Once again, it's just another one of the many perversions of God's perfect provision. So I'll challenge you to go back and review last week's message. If you missed any of that or if you have any confusion on those regards or you'd like more of the biblical references behind what I've been talking about, but it's important that we understand God's will for us sexually is that we be sexually set apart from anything and everything immoral, set apart unto God and unto what he has designed as moral for us. Let's move on and see another instruction that he gives. Um, Paul helped the Christians here in Thessalonica excel in their Christian living by helping them excel in their sexual morality. And so the second instruction is that we need to be self-controlled. There is a responsibility in there of self-control. In verses 4 and 5, Paul points out the control issues that we face. There's always something trying to control us. And here he just brings out two, but he contrasts the need for us to live under self-control in submission to God's call in our lives rather than allowing our sinful passions to run wild and be what's in control. He says that each Christian needs to know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And that word vessel there is that the New American Standard uses is the most literal translation of the Greek word Paul used when he wrote the letter. So we know that, that word, but we say, what does he mean by that? Uh, some would suggest that he is talking about a wife, that in connection with what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, saying that the wife is uh, the weaker vessel, they say it means a wife. Now, of course, in that context, what Peter's saying is that the man is to view his wife as that most precious of, like, fine china. That not, you, you put it in a very prominent, lovely place. You treasure it. And Peter's saying, you know, she is like this. So some would say that Paul is just trying to match up terms with Peter. Therefore, this is a description of a wife. Therefore, it means in the context that, man, if you want to be sexually sanctified and honorable, you need to learn how to possess a wife, like go and find a wife. Go get a wife. Go get a wife, and then you can be sexually active, and you'll be sanctified. You will be honorable. And that is definitely possible that that's what that is referring to there. Um, I believe 
that this and a lot of our translations actually try to make the connection for us, and they say that it means our body. Vessel is probably a reference to our body, which is the, the, the place in which our immaterial us dwells, right? This is where our soul and spirit resides in this physical world. This is also where the Holy Spirit of God lives within believers, Keep in mind, Paul is not merely writing this passage to men, saying, men, go find a wife. He's writing this to all Christians. He's writing this to men and women and saying, you need to learn how to possess your body, to control your body in purity, rather than letting those desires that you have lead you and direct you. So it's clear here in what Paul is saying that we can't actually allow our lustful passions to dictate how we live, to control us. We can surrender control of our lives to our sinful desires. These lustful passions describe whatever it is that a person deeply desires. Sometimes these terms are used and um, the terms themselves are neutral, but in this context there is definitely a negative sinful connotation with these lustful passions. Lustful passions vary, they differ from person to person. Even they vary in different seasons of life. One person may lustfully desire something that another person says that's odd or that's confusing or that's repulsive. The reality is everybody has lustful passions and they're very they're, they're very varied. And it's amazing what the sinful flesh can actually desire. At times, those lustful passions that uh, creep up in the mind are enough to even shock the person to say, I can't believe I just had that thought. I can't believe I just had that craving. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to live for the Lord. And that can enter into my mind or into a desire. It's amazing what types of lustful passions can arise. It doesn't really matter what it is that ignites the lustful passion, if it is something that is outside what God says is holy and honorable, if it's outside of what God has designed, our responsibility is self-control. You might say, I want to do this but we must exercise self-control. Don't let the desire control you. We must let our call from God to be sanctified and honorable control us. You could just say it this way, control your desires. Don't let your desires control you. I want to take a quick look there at verse 8 just briefly. Once again, we did this last week. Who is the one that's giving this instruction? Is it me? this morning as the preacher. No, I mean, I am a mouthpiece for this. You say, well, it's Paul. Well, Paul is saying technically it's not even him. He's writing this letter, but he's saying that this is the teachings of God. This is God's will for you. This is God's calling in your life. And if you're rejecting this, you're not rejecting man. You're not rejecting Paul. You're not rejecting me. This is a matter of whether you are obeying or disobeying God and his command. These are the things that God is telling us. That being said, a person may say, well, what would God tell the unmarried person that desires to become sexually active? You say, well, that's a very pointed question. We know what God would tell that person. God would say, exercise self-control. God would say, I've created the sexual relationship for your benefit, for your blessing, for your enjoyment, but it is something that is sacred and it is powerful and it is designed to be used within the boundaries of marriage. So, marry the right person. Exercise self-control until you can marry the right person and then enjoy it as a blessing. Be as involved as you want within the boundary of marriage. You say, okay, well, what would God tell the married person that is being tempted to be sexually involved outside of their marriage for whatever reason? God would give the exact same advice. God would say, exercise self-control.
control. Just because you have a desire for something doesn't mean you must act upon it. Instead, exercise self-control, and if you have that desire, enjoy it within the boundary of marriage. You have a spouse. The two of you perhaps need to have some communication. But enjoy the blessing as it has been given within the boundary of marriage. You say, well, what would God say to the homosexual who desires to be sexually active? Some of you are like, whoa, he's going there. What's he going to say? Listen, God would tell them the exact same thing. He would say, exercise self-control. Just because you have a desire for something doesn't mean you should act upon it. We all have desires, lustful passions for any number of different things. And that doesn't mean that we go and do them. But we exercise self-control. And if we want to act, we need to act within the boundaries that God has created. Therefore, exercise self-control until, if ever, it's able to be fulfilled within the boundary of a biblical marriage between one biological man and one biological woman. And you say, well, that's unfair. That's too limiting. That person doesn't even have desires that go that direction. Listen, we're not here to speak about desires or anything like that. We're talking about what is sexual morality. And that's clearly defined. And it's not about hating this person or this or that. Or it's not about that. It's about communicating what God says because we love people. Or we say, this is what God says. Every single one of you are a big boy and a big girl. And you have the choice. You have your desires and you will do with them as you will. You can either exercise self-control and walk in sanctification and obedience or you can just say, I'm going to let my own desires dictate what I do. And that's your choice. That is your choice. But, as we'll see next time, walking in immorality alerts the Avenger. <laughs> and when you discover who this Avenger is, ain't nobody want him on your tail. But we're not just singling out and picking on one person for their... Sexual perversion, because any sexual desire and activity outside of a biblical marriage is a sexual perversion. We're not calling one person one thing and another person by a, less, uh, a, a lesser label. Anything outside of biblical marriage is a perversion. Before, outside of, or in an illegitimate marriage. So, we know what the world would say to these scenarios. Um, this is why this message, you know, on our streaming platform, um, the social media platform in which this message streams, it actually does the closed captioning and the AI likes to go through and read. There's a possibility we'll be flagged for <laughs> some of the things said today. But we know why the world is upset with that message. It's because the world says, what you need to do is what you want to do. The world says, it's all up to what you want. If it's right to you, if you want to, if it's consensual, and then they say, well, maybe not. Maybe it doesn't even have to be consensual. If it makes sense to you, if you want to, if it's right to you, then just take whatever is necessary to be responsible in the midst of this, you know, to protect yourself, and then do as you want. And how dare anyone tell you otherwise? How dare anybody tell you to do, to not do what you want to do and what you define as right? <laughs> yeah, that's where the crime is committed in the world today, isn't it? When you tell someone to exercise self-control, you want to do that? Don't. Exercise self-control. Do what God wants you to do. If you don't do what God wants you to do, you're doing something that's wrong, sinful. That's where people in this world today say you crossed the line, you've committed a crime. Listen, our master in life needs to be our Lord Jesus, not 
our sinful lusts. And what's so amazing about Scripture is that it does address these topics that are so prominent in our lives. And not only does it address it in one place, it addresses it in multiple places through Scripture, clarifying and elaborating on all these things. It's going to take us from 1 Thessalonians 4, but I want us to turn in our Bibles now to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. One of the other notoriously sexually immoral cities in that vicinity at that time was the city of Corinth. <clears throat> Remember, Paul was actually in Corinth when he wrote 1 and 2 Thessalonians. So he's in this, probably the foremost, at least in this region, the foremost of the sexually immoral cities, writing to one of the other top sexually immoral cities. And so Paul writes to 1 the Thessalonians, and then eventually when Paul leaves Corinth, he writes these two letters that we have. He writes other letters, but these two letters we have to them. And you better believe he has to address sexual immorality there as well and sexual purity. And he devotes quite a, a large volume of writing to this subject. 1 Corinthians 5. Now, I'm just going to... Um, read some of these extended portions of Scripture. So there'll be a, a bit of reading here, and then just to make some brief comments along the way, you can write in your notes whatever jumps out at you. But there were some things going on in Corinth in the church that even caused the Romans, who let almost anything fly, caused the Romans to raise their eyebrows and go, wow, like we don't even allow that. And so that was going on inside the church, and so Paul is addressing that in chapter 5. I want to, to jump in here, starting in verse 9. Here's some good stuff to think about here. And again, all of this will eventually end up in um, this subject of self-control, how we need to be walking in self-control, and how God has commanded us uh, in ways to help us to be able to live in sanctification and honor in this regard. Paul says, starting in verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Okay, just a few comments here. Uh, Paul was talking to the Corinthian church about their need to uh, not associate with the sexually immoral people. Well, he had to clarify here. He's like, well, I'm not talking about those in the world that are sexually immoral, and not only sexually immoral, but also just covetous and swindlers and all of those types of things. Look, if they're part of the world, if they don't claim to follow Christ, what can you do about it? They don't have a relationship with God. They don't know God. They don't care about his commands. They're not tarnishing Christ's name. They're not associating with him. So I'm not talking about that. Plus, practically speaking, you'd have to be just removed off the face of the planet because that's what the world does. He says, to clarify, I'm saying, if it's a so-called brother, a so-called brother or sister in Christ, someone who says they're a Christian but is living an immoral life, or any of these sins, a sinful life outwardly, those are the ones that you need to not associate with. Well, that's kind of harsh for us to hear, isn't it? <laughs> You're like, well, that sounds pretty judgmental. Well, Paul even says, we don't judge the people of the world. God is going to do that. But he's saying, we judge within the church. You say, no, the church is not supposed to be a judgmental place. It's a place of grace and of love. Well, it is, but we are commanded to help maintain purity within the church. And so if this is God's standard and we say we're followers of Christ, Christ says, I designed the sexual relationship to be um, partaken of within the boundary of morality. 
in marriage. And if you're going to go outside of that and then claim to follow Christ, you're not acting in obedience. So the church is supposed to... um, He says at the end of verse 13, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Don't associate. Don't even eat with such a one. That's a good preventative measure for someone wanting to get involved in an immoral um, arrangement. Now, because of this discussion of judging, he then goes on in chapter 6, the beginning, to talk about lawsuits and how we shouldn't be taking one another to court, that the churches should be able to... um, help decide these matters. I mean, because that's what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to be standing in judgment in relation to sin. But then, we don't need to read that because it doesn't fit with where we're going today, but we do want to read verses 9 through 11 of chapter 6. Notice what Paul says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators... That's a technical term for describing sexual behavior before marriage or outside of marriage. Nor idolaters, so even if it's for religious practices, um, nor adulterers, that describes a married person that's going outside of their marriage for sexual activity. Nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, both describing homosexual activity, guys dressing as women, being used as women, homosexual activity. He brings all those together. Notice they're all in the same context. He's not like isolating some and calling some this worse or this one better or this one. He's just saying it's all wrong. Notice what he goes on to then bring into this list in verse 10. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This is a very fascinating passage. Again, he's not trying to, like we always do, put uh, levels of, of crime on these things. He's bringing up the more acceptable things like fornication. And you're like, well, that's never acceptable. Well, sometimes we say, well, I won't judge that one or adultery as harsh as I will some of these others. But what about covetousness or stealing that he brings into the same context? He's saying, if this describes your life, it does not look like you're saved. A person who's living in these ways is not descriptive of a person who's going to inherit the kingdom of God. And he points out the fact that we were these people. But we were. We are not now because we've been called out of that into Christ, and we live differently now. Let's look on now to chapter 6, verses 12 and following. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Pause right there. There were some in Corinth that were saying, eh, I mean, what's the big deal? It's all going to be done away with in the end, just like the food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. Well, the body is for sexual activity, and sexual activity is for the body. It's really not going to, God's just going to do away with all of it in the end. Well, Paul says, not so, because God will raise up the body, and the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Notice what he says in verses 14 and following. Now God has not only raised the the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Remember when we were looking at Genesis 2.24 last week when it talks about the man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. So she goes from woman to wife. So there's marriage. And then the two, the husband and wife, shall become one flesh. And we say that's speaking of the sexual relationship. 
If it's not clear enough in that passage, we have divine commentary here where Paul says, because of that, you realize that when you are sexually active, you're becoming one flesh with whomever you're active with. So it better not be a prostitute. It better not be in any immoral relationship. Notice he goes on. But, he, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. So there is something uniquely um, tragic about sexual sins. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. We know that passage. We hear that one all the time. We use it when we debate things like, well, what should I eat today? Well, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so I should eat something that's going to be good for, good for the temple of the Spirit. Or I'm going to get involved in some kind of extreme action sports. Well, is that going to be good for the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, we might say, depending on, we use it whether we're going to pierce it or tattoo it or all this. You, you know, it's okay, in a secondary measure, we can apply it to anything because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But you realize the context in which that is used? It's within the context of our sexual behavior. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is not to be used in immoral ways. That's an interesting thing when we use that text to realize it's not talking about how many cheeseburgers you eat. <laughs> you can use it in that context, but realize that it's really about the sexual behaviors. Now, chapter 7. You say, how can we make it through like an entire section of 1 Corinthians in one message, and you can't even make it through two verses in 1 Thessalonians? Well, chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. Isn't that interesting that they put the husband there first? Husband, do your duty. Likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another. Except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. And come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Another interesting passage of Scripture here. Paul is pointing out the fact that he understands, just as God understands, we live in a very sexually immoral world. And there, he says, because of sexual immorality, because we all have the potential to be getting involved in something sexual, sexually immoral, God has provided a solution. That if you're married, you have your spouse. If you have those desires running around inside of you, that's why you have your spouse. Husbands, fulfill your duty to your wife. Wife, to your husband. <clears throat> you need to realize that God has provided, if you're married, God has provided one person on the face of the planet to be, for your spouse to be intimate with, and that's you. So hence he says, it's your duty to be an unlocked gate into that, into that garden, into that fountain of refreshment. Let them in. It says in verse 5, stop depriving one another. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? that it even goes there in Scripture. Why? Why stop depriving? Because when you do, that's an open door for Satan. When Satan hears the word no in that context, at the same time he hears the door creaking open for him to walk in and begin to cue the, the, the sexual temptation 
immoral temptation. Satan realizes just how much immorality destroys people's lives, people's families, church families, you name it. So why would he mess around with the lighter weight stuff if he can just go for the throat? And so when there's depriving going on, and that's why Paul says it this way, stop depriving one another, because the you know, if you want to mutually agree, if the both of you want to say it's okay for us to say no for, or to, to agree not to for a while for the sake of prayer, fine. But don't let that season last too long because Satan will come in and begin to tempt. Satanic, satanically arranged, constructed sexual temptation. Does that mean if a spouse deprives the other, it's okay for that one feeling deprived to go and look elsewhere? No, of course not, because we're called to self-control. But even Paul recognizes how challenging it can be for a person to exercise self-control in this area. So just because there might be some uh, fighting going on in that part of a marriage doesn't mean you have the permission to go elsewhere. if you, if you are in this role of depriving, you are throwing out a stumbling block. In essence, you're opening the door and saying, Satan, come on in and tempt my spouse. I'm just putting it forwardly here so we understand the implications of what Paul's saying here. Well, let's take a look now at verses 8 and 9. One other thing to point out here. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it's good for them if they remain even as I. Paul's saying it's, it's good if you want to remain single. Paul was single. If you're unmarried, if you've been widowed, that's fine. But, verse 9, if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So again, Paul's solution here, self-control. And if you can exercise self-control your whole life and you can live single, then that's fine. He says, that's good. That's fine. But if you have those desires, it is important that you marry. Marry the right person. There are other passages of Scripture that talk about marrying the right person. (laughs) Marry the right person. And then be as sexually active with them as you need to be to stay pure. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we need to control our bodies, exercise self-control because of the command of God to be sanctified and honorable, to be sexually pure, sexually moral. And so because of that call and command, we must control our bodies rather than letting the desires run away and control us can be a a struggle, of course, but even that's built into Scripture as Paul addresses the unmarried, saying when you start to lack (laughs) self-control, get married. And for those of you within marriage, that's why you don't use the sexual relationship as a weapon. You don't deprive one another. You keep that communication flowing in in your marriage because there's immorality out there, and we are to be walking in morality. We will not take the time to go further, but we still have a lot to discuss in 1 Thessalonians about staying in the boundaries, about being submissive to God and seeking His strength. And I realize this is really quite a subject to consider in this type of a setting. For some, it's genuinely exciting, not just because you like the subject, but because you say, I want to excel in this area of my life. I've been trying hard to stay sexually pure, and I can use every bit of help and encouragement and insight from Scripture that I can get. You say, I love studying this. Some of the parents are like, I actually am fine with my kids hearing this because if they're going to hear about it, they need to hear about it from the Bible in church. Others are like, man, I do not like this subject because I feel the heavy weight of conviction. (laughs) Because, man, I struggle in this area, you say, and I just feel like it's almost too much to bear. I've crossed the line. We'll see next week. I've alerted the avenger even through my sins that I've committed against other people in this regard. 
You say, I, I just, it's, it's heavy on my heart. Well, can I just remind you that if you feel that heavy, heavy weight and pressure, it's not me or this church picking on you at all. In reality, what it is, is it's an element of God's discipline. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is an aspect of God's discipline in your life, disciplining you to bring you into holiness, into the right path. Feeling that weight of conviction is to draw you to a place of repentance and confession to where you say, you know, I shouldn't be living that way. I need to be living in holiness. Yes, I know what the world says, and my flesh wants to agree with the world, but I know what God says, and I need to walk in obedience. So don't forget what 1 John 1, 9 says, that if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, don't abuse that. Don't be like, ah, he'll forgive me tomorrow. I'll ask, I'll ask for forgiveness in the morning. No. We know that if we've committed the sin, he will forgive. And with a person with a contrite heart, I just encourage you, go to the Lord. Confess those things just between you and him. And, uh, and allow that fellowship to be restored. Well, let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for the clear instruction of your word. We do want to pray for our sanctification in this regard, that we would be walking in your will. For those who may be struggling with different areas of uh, immor immoral actions, immoral behaviors, we pray that you would draw them near to you and help them to rely upon you for strength. And for those who are walking and trying to maintain purity, to walk and excel in sexual morality, that you would help them to keep excelling, to keep going. We pray for your blessing and protection on the marriages here, that you would bless every aspect of their lives. And uh, for those who are um, struggling with self-control, God, provide for them uh, the, the spouse of your choosing um, and that they would be able to maintain purity. Lord, all of these things we bring to you thanking you being God, the creator and designer of all these things, and the one that includes the instructions. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, don't forget we have a membership meeting immediately upon our dismissal, so don't go far, and if there are other members down in nursery and all of those other places, go and get them, and we'll have a brief meeting. Other than that, thank you for being here today and sitting through such a touchy subject. We'll continue on with it next week as well. But may God bless you all. We are dismissed.